Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. We are happy to have you again at another Brookings webinar. webinar. And this time, we're going to be talking about something that is both relevant and timely um, as the country prepares to open up. Um, my name is Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee. I'm a fellow in the Center for Technology Innovation, which is located in our Governance Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. And I'm happy to be joined today by two colleagues, uh, both I feel like I've worked with, one actually works with me, the other one I've just known for years, who I think are really poised to talk about this big debate on if we were to open up as a country, where and how will we track the rate of infection to avoid another wave of, um, you know, of a global pandemic? And I'm happy to be joined today by uh, my colleague at Brookings in the Center for Technology Innovation, the David Rubicide Fellow, um, Alex Engler. Just raise your hand, Alex, so they know, and you greet them. And Michelle Richardson, who is the director of the Data Privacy Project over at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Michelle, wave your hand. Mm -hmm. um, before we jump in, um, I just released a blog uh, in partnership with a colleague at the John Locke Foundation around contact tracing and particularly digital contact tracing. And I wanna open up with a general question. And for those of you who are watching us, I know that you're gonna have questions and I just ask that you would submit those via email to events at brookings.edu, events at brookings.edu. If you send them via email or via Twitter at brookingsgov, or via our hashtag for this event, which would be hashtag AI bias. All right, so I wanna actually go into this conversation and Alex, I'm actually gonna jump over to you first. Great. Um, you're a technologist, you're a data scientist by trade, um, someone who has looked carefully at this debate, just wrote something about this for uh, Brookings website. Technology is not new to helping us to sort of mitigate this, these types of risk. It's not new to solving large social problems, right? Um, and it's definitely not something that um, we've seen that hasn't really layered on an, a layers of efficiency and effectiveness, right? Particularly when you're dealing with mass scale projects. So I want to start with your thoughts on the use of technology, particularly the use of AI, uh, when we're looking at how we're actually going to mitigate the future risk associated with COVID-19. So why don't I open up for you and just give us give us some background before we jump into what are the opportunities of con digital contact tracing and for the potential harms. Sure, and thanks, Nicole. Really um, glad you're doing this timely, important conversation. So, you know, I think people are broadly familiar with some of the ways that traditional technologies have been helping in the fight against COVID-19, right? We're familiar with sort of the health diagnostics, we're familiar with the communication tools, some of the data collection. Everyone's very familiar with Zoom and Netflix, obviously very helpful in all this. Uh, whereas maybe AI, it's a little harder for people to tell where the value is. This is an interesting question because over the last decade, we've seen a fundamental change in how valuable AI can be. It's really totally changed in many applications it can help with. And so you might be tempted to think, oh, well, it's helped in all these other ways. Obviously, it's going to have a big impact in a broad suite of ways on COVID-19. That, at least so far, hasn't turned out to be true. Uh, we have examples of AI in the news that are probably snake oil. Um, I'd point towards the using AI and thermal imaging cameras to detect people walking around with fevers. The evidence that that is working or a good idea to implement to keep people out of grocery stores, not, not very good. I'm going to go ahead and say that's a, that's a bad idea. Um, there's areas where it's helping at the margins. Some of the COVID-19 models that look at the spread of COVID-19 use a little bit of what you'd call machine learning and there's some value there. You have examples where it hasn't yet done much, but we could feasibly see it do things. Um, there's some new evidence that the testing, the nasal swab testings have uh, not as high accuracy as we'd like them to. And so looking at an alternative or complementary diagnosis strategy that also uses CT scans, a little early, but you know, if this drags on for long enough, that could potentially be something um, plausible that we, we want to explore. And then we have some cases where we just have no idea. AI-driven dr uh, drug discovery for pharmaceuticals and even things like estimating uh, what uh, coronavirus looks like. I mean, literally, it's protein structure. It's a protein folding AI application. Those could be useful. We really don't know. Um, and so it's hard to tell at a broad swath. Broadly speaking, the impact hasn't 
been that substantial and we're still sort of looking for an example of AI to break through and, and do something really meaningful, which, which certainly could happen. Yeah, you know, I actually read an article the other day about the use of AI to identify whether or not people are wearing their face mask. So they were talking about facial recognition technologies that would basically scan people in stores and then kind of, you know, create enforcement if you're not wearing your face mask. I, I think to your point, we don't know yet, but there's probably going to be a whole lot of applications around this, right? <laughs> um, so Michelle, one area that we know is going to be used is in the contact tracing part of it. So for those of you that are listening, you know, obviously some of the safeguards that are being suggested and proposed by the medical sci medic, uh, doctors and the scientists are essentially an aggressive uh, post plan, you know, that would help us in our recovery and relief of this disease. Uh, outside of widespread testing, which many of you already know, we're not even sure if we can actually need that capacity, given some now of the shortages of swabs and other materials needed to do that. Contact tracing has been in the news lately, Michelle, and contact tracing is not new to the public health community, right? They did that with the spread of uh, HIV AIDS, most recently Ebola, we've seen that. And that's, for those of you who don't know, is basically, you know, being able to track the network of connections of a potentially infected person so that you can actually quarantine that person or that the network of people quickly to reduce the spread. Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, said that it's going to take an army of contact tracers. So physical people have historically done this job. Uh, but the CDC just released guidelines, Michelle, that said that digital tools could actually be useful in these cases. So I want to talk a little bit about that because you're Miss Privacy Lady. You know, all the meetings that we sit in, you talk about data privacy. This is going to require some information to be collected. And so before I go into a particular application that's being proposed by um, uh, companies like Apple and, and Google, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about your thoughts on privacy in these contact tracing uh, models and what are the implications in terms of what's going to be collected, how it's going to be used. Sounds very familiar, right, Michelle? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And it's fascinating to hear it called um, health surveillance, right? If you are a privacy person, surveillance has a really negative connotation. It usually means the government out there secretly collecting information on people for criminal purposes or intelligence purposes, right? Someone's done something wrong and the government is coming to get them. But in the public health space, surveillance is very different. Um, you can look at the CDC's recommendations. You can look at a report that came out two weeks ago from Duke. Um, and it is a broad term to encompass all the ways data has to be collected and shared about the disease and who has it and how to fight it. Not all of that is individualized. Not all of it is sensitive. And I think we would hear most of it and say, yeah, that's exactly what doctors and professionals who are operating under ethical codes, right, should be doing with our data and how they should be sharing it. And it is complex because this seems to be so localized and be so different depending on the community and everything from how they live and how they travel, where they work, um, and even things like the accessibility to tests, right, um, and whether the data actually reflect who is sick and who needs help at all. So I think what we want to think about as contact tracing in the bigger picture, right? Because it's only going to be one piece is, um, what is the purpose of it, right? What is the follow on for it? It is not done for the sake of contact tracing in and of itself. Is it that we want people to take self quarantining more seriously, right? Is it that we want people to go ahead and get tests? And if so, can we give them tests? We don't want to um, panic people, right? Unnecessarily by implying to them that they may be sick if they're not and there's actually no health care available for them um, if they are sick. And it's supposed to be one link of the chain, right, and part of the holistic response. So it can be done right. Um, we know that in the past it has been done by hand and is currently still happening in many ways. Right, by hand, yep. Right? Uh, and that there are benefits to it. Even if we get the tech going, you still want the people doing the outreach because there's a lot of data to show that that human connection actually helps people become more forthcoming. It's an opportunity to give them useful information about what they should actually do next. And so we should see it as something to complement what we're doing not something to replace what otherwise needs to happen. Yeah, and I want to go back just stay on you, Michelle, before we get into the recent announcement by Apple and Google to sort of uh, implement uh, what they think is a privacy by design tool, right, when it comes to the contact tracing. 
We have been talking for a long time, Michelle, about passing federal privacy legislation. You know, our European friends have passed the general data protection rules, uh, GDPR known to most people. Uh, we've seen conversations about privacy literally happen around the world. California, just here in the United States, has passed their own privacy bills. Does this, any of this sort of like say, uh, I told you so, or um, we should have had a framework for privacy legislation out there before you know, we get to this point? I, I'm just, just curious. That wasn't a question I had on your paper, but I'm just curious. Yeah, well, I, I would say this. Um, you know, we've had a rough couple of years, right? Corporate behavior has not met people's expectations. It's been surprising to them and they have become suspicious, right? And we may be in a better situation right now if we had a law that better aligned those things, right? People could trust technology more. They might feel more comfortable sharing their information knowing that it would be locked down and not repurposed for things that would be surprising or offensive to them, right? And companies would also then have more clarity. I think a lot of the proposals we're seeing at the federal level have clear exceptions for public interest research. So to the extent some of them want to help, you know, public officials and contribute to this, they would be able to do so with some clear parameters and liability protection, right? That's what comes with it, um, instead of worrying about where the line is. So uh, I think what we want to see is something like what happened in Europe, where they had a baseline, their officials came out and said, and this is how we're interpreting it, right? You still have some of the same principles that we've had for many years in Europe, but here's how they apply to the COVID-19 situation. And we would have benefited from being able to do that also, but uh, hopefully this will get Congress moving sometime soon to get us a law so next time this happens, you won't have this uncertainty. Yeah, so if anybody's watching and listening, it is about time that we actually move forward with pri federal privacy legislation. That's just a shameless plug. Now, Alex, <laughs> just last week, Apple and Google announced a partnership to actually help with uh, the CDC's guidance around the use of digital tools as a supplement, not a replacement to the physical contact tracers that Michelle spoke about. I'm curious with you, I mean, the technology uh, has a couple of phases to it. One is the release of APIs, I believe to sort of force some type of interoperability between um, Google and Apple, the Android and the Apple iOS, right? So some sort of harmonization there. Uh, but it's mostly relying upon Bluetooth enabled technologies where there would be a transfer of not necessarily your personal information, but these beacons that would help in some location tracking so that you could determine if you were within the vicinity or proximity of somebody that was infected. So the way I understand it, I could be sitting next to a random stranger if I voluntarily downloaded that app like they choose to do. So this is something you have to opt into. That beacon would transfer if for some reason I sort of declare or announce that I've actually been infected to the public health authorities, it would spread that information and news to others. So I would love your opinion on how you think, um, pri how private you actually think that technology will be. And if you think it's going to be an effective tool in the long game to sort of help with the millions or hundreds of thousands of contact tracers that we're actually going to need physically? Sure. Um, yeah, this is one of the biggest questions facing the sort of poly res policy response to the pandemic right now. So, you know, it's important to note that this is proximity tracking. Mm -hmm. So it keeps track of who else you're close to who also has the app enabled. Um, you would have to update your operating system, download an app, consent to some sort of giant an endless text box, right, uh, in order to have this happen. But once that did, it would be sharing an anonymous signal from your phone with other phones who have the app downloaded. So there is no location data. It's useful to note for privacy reasons, right? But it is certainly sharing your contacts uh, with other people in certain circumstances. So let's I want to talk briefly about the theory of how this would work, and then I'll uh, really quickly on that privacy side. So, you know, this isn't going to get rolled out till mid May. Um, and then public health organizations would need to build an app on top of this system that lets people actually use it. Um, and it still is dependent on testing too, because if you interact with someone else who has COVID-19, but neither of you ever gets a test, we'll never know. You know, there's no way to self-report or have the agency report. So none of this replaces testing. And the math makes it a little tricky. You know, Pew says 81% of people in the U.S. own smartphones. So you're starting at a baseline of 81%. Of those, how many um, update their operating system and then download the app? Um, you know, and if, they're, if they have real privacy concerns, as Michelle said, they may be disincentivized to, to engage in this, right? If, they're not, if they don't trust what's going to happen with their data. Of those, 
how many people voluntarily report that they got sick or enable their uh, public health organization to do it. And that brings you down to a number. And then the number of interactions that it will, um, that will be caught by this is the square root of that because you need everybody uh, on, you know, two pairs of people. So both people to do it. So, you know, the United Kingdom, uh, Oxford University did a study in the UK that said if 60% of smartphone users, I'm sorry, if 80% of smartphone users, about 56% of the population did this, it would be enough to stop the outbreak in its tracks. Uh, that's an kind of an incredible number. It's probably optimistic, um, but it, it, you know, and, and lower numbers would still significantly reduce the spread. So there, there may be uh, real reasons to think about it. Um, right, the, 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 even an incomplete percentage of people signing up could have a significant event on content, uh, contact tracing. I will mention that Singapore tried this and the direct okay, yeah. <laughs> program, this is his quote. Well, this is the quote I found without obscenities in it. We use trace together to supplement contact tracing, not replace it. And he's a very strong stance against the idea of fully replacing the human side of it. Mm -hmm. So it can complement, and I think we should think about how to best do that. Um, but there's no way it's a replacement. Uh, and it, it you know, probably takes some federal or centralized coordination to do really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pushing a, a common set of guidelines. Everyone needs to update their operating system, download the app, sign in. And, and, and then report symptoms and also uh, your testing results. Um, so you, in that circumstance, we could see it be somewhat valuable and worth doing. You, you said something though that I wanna keep on you for just a second. You said this word of everyone. <laughs> now yeah. across the sea, you know, there are countries that have required people to actually engage in this, uh, what Michelle sort of referred to this public health surveillance, right? For the purposes of minimizing the risk of exposure to disease and reducing the outbreak. But in the United States, is a fine line with everyone, right, being able to do this. So I wanted to actually talk to you a little bit, uh, just staying on this whole idea of the technology. Uh, one of the concerns that I read about in the technology is the ability of, despite not using location data, but the ability to still de-anonymize some of the data that's available to people. So I'm really curious, and Michelle, you can jump in. I mean, those are some typical privacy concerns. You know, I think that it's handled in terms of the use of any digital tool on the opt-in and the consent side of it, if it's a voluntary measure. But what about, you know, let's just start with this whole idea that you can extrapolate or infer certain things about particular people based on where they live. Particularly if uh, my beacons only show up in my dense community or, you know, housing community or my place where I basically do all of my stuff, which pretty much looks like me. Um, what does that say in terms of, you know, sort of taking that and re-aggregating it to come up with inferences about the types of people that are being exposed? So I'll mention a, a couple of things. You're, you're right that everyone is a sort of useless goal, right? And one thing that's noteworthy is that even if a group of people like within one city, right, you could have, you could have one state not engage in this process at all and another city get their population to engage at a fairly high level and it would still be very useful in that city. Right, so you don't actually need everyone to do it. There is a localized effect if a lot of people in one area have it. There's also definitely privacy concerns, and I'm sure Michelle will know more than I, but I think actually the privacy concerns that I've seen are mostly about small amounts of data combined with subject matter, like combined with um, personal experience. So if you go have lunch with someone and that's the only person you've seen outside in two weeks, and then you get a notice from the app that says, um, you know, you, you've been interacting with someone who has now tested positive for COVID-19, that's probably a privacy uh, harm, right? And that's, I think, more about combining the information from the app with uh, your, your subjective experience. Now, you could argue that that may happen in normal old contact tracing anyway. So I'm, right. I'm curious what Michelle has to say. About yeah, that. Michelle, what, what do you think about that? Oh. Michelle, you are mute. Michelle, you're on mute. <laughs> Hit the button. Okay, there you go. Um, and so I, I think there are a few harms we want to mitigate here, right? And we've seen some of this already overseas when people have been identified as being sick, right? They are being harassed. That is actually quite easy to reassociate people. You only need to know a few data points. Um, to figure out a real person's identity, right? Especially when you're talking about things like location. And while we say this is not location, per se, right? I think Alex is right that you only need a few other data points to put in there before it becomes location, right? If everyone in a family gets dinged at the same time, they'll say, wait a minute, where were all, 
who's the only person that all four of us, you know, we're in contact with. Um, and so it's going to be easier to reassociate some of this um, than people realize. There are also questions, though, about how voluntary it will remain, right? Um, what happens when you go to work and your boss says, I want to see your app. Right, we're gonna make sure that you're on it. Um, and that way we can track this um, or going back into school. There can be consequences for failing to participate in this if it becomes sort of a baseline that is expected of people. Um, and you know, there's always questions of selective enforcement, right? I mean, that's the always thing, the thing about these sorts of data sets that aren't 100% accurate and people are gonna have incredible discretion about how to use the data and who's gonna have you know, consequences for appearing to be sick or being notified. And it is very hard to make sure that it is um, used fairly. Um, I think one of the other problems though too with this is um, we don't even know that it's accurate for what it's supposed to represent, right? And I think that's fair to talk about when we're thinking about privacy, security, and other data protection more broadly, right? Um, part of the question is, is, does it actually work and therefore worth the trade-off? And so the question isn't just, do all of us put it on our phones? Mm -hmm. The question is, is it a good proxy for whether I'm likely to get sick? Uh, so how do we account for things like asymptomatic transmission? Or the fact that probably a bunch of us have already had it, right? Um, or that you're going to be getting false positives, you might give people a false sense of security that they're safe when they're not. Um, and there are people who, even if they get, you know, notified, what if they are in an essential sector and they have to go to work to feed their kids? What, what am I supposed to do with that information, right? So I think we want to think more holistically about what are we supposed to do with this information once we give it to people, right? You know, how do we actually use it to serve people who need help? I'm very lucky. I, I'm working from home, right? There are a lot of people who don't have that, um, that privilege. How do we make sure those sorts of people are able to use the information or getting service for it, right? So I think that's where we keep thinking about, we wanna make sure that we're thinking holistically about this, about what happens afterwards, what's the consequence for getting this information and is it actionable? And that's how we make sure these sorts of things are just a link in the chain to making sure people are served well. Yeah, no, and I think it's a, those are very valid points for both of you because I think we're gonna see more digital health tools sort of deployed. And Alex, did you wanna jump in or? Yeah, I, I want to. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, it's we're not in the same room, but I can actually see everybody's body language, like we yeah, talked. Okay. So jump in, and then I'll go into the next question. <laughs> so I, I, I want to respond to what Michelle said. I think she said one thing that I want to uh, really, really valuable, and we sh I want to encourage, even endorse. And then one thing I want to push back on a little bit. So I think I, I slightly disagree with with um, contact tracing and with uh, technology based contact tracing is the ability to tell people who are asymptomatic that they may be um, COVID-19 carriers. You're totally right that people who are essential workers are still put in a bind by this. You're totally right about people who need to go make, um, to, who still need to go to work and like engage in society to survive. It doesn't fix that. But for people who don't have any reason to think they're sick, contact tracing can be a fast way to say, hey, you need to be more careful because you potentially, potentially, right, also could be wrong, be exposed. So it, given that the asymptomatic part of this is such a big problem, we might have this, you know, four, five, six day asymptotic incubation period, which is a long time, right? And you're getting more infectious in that period of time. This is a partially valuable because it helps with that. Mm -hmm. um, now, the point I want to mention that Michelle also brought up that I think is phen phenomenal is that this is definitely not an equitable solution. If you even look at just um, who owns a smartphone, right? So lower income people are less likely to own a smartphone. Um, the low income people who do own smartphones are more likely to have Android phones. And there's reason to believe that because Android phones are so different and Google doesn't have control over the hardware, that this Bluetooth contact tracing will be less effective on uh, Android phones as it will on iPhones where Apple has control over the hardware technology and the software. So it's sort of a closer grip on the whole process. So for a few reasons, I think that uh, uh, disparate effectiveness is, is definitely something we should be concerned about. Yeah, no, and you all know that I write on the digital divide and you know, just yesterday there was a conversation about people's operating systems, um, Alex, to your point, weren't gonna be updated enough to actually enable the technology, particularly if you had an older phone or potentially a uh, afterlife lease, you know, which we know because of the prohibitive cost of broadband and device access, it goes back to people of color and lower income people and oftentimes rural people. 
which actually brings me to this question. So I do want to unpack this whole thing about equity real quick and then go back into this conversation around, you know, then what do we do? Because we're, you know, our hands are tied essentially as we try to get out of this. I mean, the unfortunate thing when it comes to equity is uh, Rashawn Ray, our colleague here in Brookings, just wrote about the fact that uh, people of color uh, are disproportionately affected by the virus more so than others due to their living conditions. You know, they tend to live in denser communities. So it's not a surprise that uh, majority black cities like Chicago and Detroit and other places were highly uh, disproportionately impacting people of color when it came to that. They have tend to have pre-existing medical conditions. They tend to also live in places where they don't have adequate and sufficient health care. So they may have a smartphone, but what happens? And I want to talk about the flip side of it because I think the companies have pretty much put out their privacy architecture in the public domain. But what about the public health authorities that have this information? What do they do with it? Because the assumption is that the information will flow to the public health authority. In my mind, I'm thinking about things like geofencing that create these virtual barriers around parts of the city of Chicago that allow, that basically when you find out that you have more cases of infection, people can't come out of those communities, you know, almost like a plantation. They're kind of stuck, right? Uh, will we see some of that? Or is that a harm with the public health side of it that we have to have the same type of transparency around data privacy and data risk? Because I haven't seen that conversation happen. Like, what do we do with them um, outside of being an assistant to them and sort of getting information to them? And, you know, how do we avoid uh, consumer harm, Michelle, from the public health authorities that would have that data and could do what they please, you know, post-COVID. Right, I would like to disassociate myself. <laughs> the coronavirus plantations, please. <laughs> um, and, and this is sort of... Uh, Michelle, you know I was gonna say that I could say that. <laughs> Right. Well, and this is where it can get dystopian quickly, right? That's and a lot right. of these ideas may have sort of a cachet where you're like, yeah, that makes sense. We want to keep sick people away from the rest of us, right? Um, and so this is how um, the data itself may be neutral, but how we choose to use it is going to determine whether we're actually treating people fairly and actually being successful in this. So you could um, imagine, for example, having that sort of location data, and you could probably get it a lot of different ways of where cases are popping up, right? It doesn't even have to be tracing. It could be um, people who are Googling symptoms. It could be people who are calling their doctors asking for tests. Um, it could be spikes in fevers. It could be people buying more um, cough medicine, right? There's a lot of different things that you could rely on in aggregate form that could forewarn a spike in people, right? But doesn't um, necessarily infringe on any one person's privacy. Right, and the goal then should though be to get services to those communities and not act in a punitive way. And I think that is some of the lessons that um, the CDC, the World Health Organization have shown from past um, epidemics and pandemics um, that the more you get people afraid of interacting with their government, the more they're gonna hide that they're sick and they're not gonna do the things that they need to take care of themselves. So as long as we keep moving towards service, getting people, um, treatment, get, get them tests, help them with their education, their work, getting food, things like that, that people are struggling with now, um, that is going to serve them and the community better than trying to be punitive and lock people in places. Yep, and Alex, what's what your thoughts on the potential for the public health authorities to use these in ways that it wasn't designed for? Yeah, I'm gonna take a um, slightly different take, which I think that the public health, like my take on this is that we should actually be asking for more data um, especially more um, public, maybe circumstantially public data. Um, there was a letter, this isn't just me, there was a letter recently from Elizabeth Warren and Cory Booker and Kamala Harris and um, another the Congressional Black Caucus has called for this as well, to get more data, especially yeah. with racial breakdowns from the CDC. Um, where the CDC has reporting national level race data uh, on COVID-19 deaths, but nothing else. And if you, uh, our, our colleague, Andre Perry has a, a really, um, a great piece, though it's very hard to read, about the the fatality disparities with African Americans. Um, he talks about Chicago and Washington D.C. and New Orleans, and they're and they're staggering. Um, and I think one of the it's actually harder to ignore this when we know about them. Um, I think it's, it's frankly it was it seems like it was very easy to ignore it when it wasn't getting reported on and the data wasn't available. Um, so there's a few efforts to make that data more available. The White Houses and the um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are, are saying they're going to release this data at a more granular level. 
Um, and I actually think we should be pushing the CDC to, to release more specific data, um, uh, more public, this is where I get into sort of publicly, by this I mean maybe a researcher only uh, a wow. data environment um, or potentially under differential privacy um, uh, methods. And, and if they need help with that, the Census Bureau has a great expertise in this. There's external companies that could help. Um, if, if, you know, if the privacy is the problem, they should engage with other stakeholders and, and um, partners because this is a, at the level we're talking about, it's a solvable problem and we would know more about the disparate effects of, of COVID-19. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting too because the tech companies have essentially said, hey, we'll turn this off, right, when the utility is done. And I think that's a valiant way to sort of say, in our role in this, in terms of digital contact tracing, and this is not just happening with Apple and Google, but a whole variety of companies have sort of jumped into the space as we spoke about, you know, the key is they can turn it off, but I do like what you're saying for the public health authorities, are they thinking of the long game, right, in terms of this, and can they actually collect the information that they're receiving from contact tracing along with the aggregated information that's coming on different um, communities and help us understand how we use this information to avoid a similar circumstance. I mean, Alex, that goes to like the power of AI, right? <laughs> AI has really been designed for us to sort of make these types of predictions so we don't find ourselves having the same conversations. I mean, looking forward, coming out of this, I mean, we haven't really talked a lot about, you know, direct uh, AI applications and COVID-19 efforts, whether in the mitigation or post, but do you think that there's a place for that in terms of what you're talking about on the research side or on the uh, vaccination side or other sides? Uh, Nicole is being nice enough to plug the next thing uh, that I'm releasing at Perkins. That's how that's that's what we're doing here. That's this whole thing. Um, and so I just wrote a piece that's hopefully coming out this week on a call for a new set of models to predict risk um, for COVID-19 spread. Uh, you this these are would be partially AI, but they're frankly closer to classic epidemiological models with some machine learning. This isn't like a new thing that just appeared. This is building on a hundred years of epidemiological uh, subject matter knowledge. Because there are so many emerging data sources, um, and there's really a lot, uh, Facebook and Google have this long running survey um, on their sites asking people to tell them if they have symptoms. Um, we have literal surveys where people are calling and asking uh, about whether they're able to get tests. Um, and other, other interventions. We have an expanding amount of demographic information that we know is relevant, uh, income, and um, also you know, pre-existing health conditions. We have these new mobility data sets. We have more and more you know, testing uh, and case level data and death rate, and then excess death rate, which is probably really what the death rates are. Um, all this combined is really, really hard to interpret for the many, many local um, and state and federal policymakers who have to make really important decisions, right? Thousands of policymakers across the US have to choose when to reopen schools, when to ease business restrictions, when to let people gather, where to allocate tests, which there won't be enough of, where to allocate um, contract tracers, which there won't be enough of, when we have a vaccine, who to give vaccines to first, which we won't have enough of. Um, and so when you look across the pure number of decisions that we need to make, there is enough data to argue for um, models that they're not trying to long distance predict the future, but tell us in the near term who needs the most help. And I actually think you could use better, um, you know, demographic data uh, and socioeconomic data and data about who's essential workers to actually improve the argument for helping people most at risk, the subpopulations we're really worried about. Now, it's not guaranteed to happen, but I, there's an argument that we could do that, and I think it'd be very valuable. Right. Michelle, you want to chime in? Yeah, yeah, and that type of demographic data has long been collected and used for equity purposes, right, for literally decades in all sorts of different sectors, including health. So it would absolutely be um, appropriate to collect that to make sure that the services are getting where it needs to be done. And I think we would want to make sure that AI doesn't become a cure-all, right, or be sort of like a, a cannon killing a fly. I know there was an article um, in the paper that cited a small company, I remember it was called um, a vendor who said, well, just give me access to people's medical records. And that way I can predict where, you know, we should be sending the equipment like the PPE and where the hospital beds are. That data is already available, right? We have public health officials screaming it from the rooftop, sending more stuff. We know where it needs to go. We do not need to throw open everyone's medical records, right, for AI processing to get that information. So we do want to direct it towards um, where it is actually going to provide un unique value. We know that 
is going to require some play in the system, right? But especially if it's done with, and I think this is something I should have mentioned earlier, when you say public health officials, not just companies, right? They do have a different relationship with the population. They do have different ethical guidelines as doctors and people who are under, you know, review boards. They have um, different goals in mind, right? And so in some ways it's scary to have the government involved, but in others they do have a caretaking responsibility that they're trying to fulfill that you might not get from any guy who's a uh, sitting on an API, right, and pulling down people's data, and you're not really sure what they're doing with it. But, you know, we would also just flag a few um, things that have been um, discovered over the last few years where AI has not always served people equally. You know, these are things like um, processing of language to diagnose neurological diseases, right, and that even things like changes in dialect could make it very ineffective for certain groups. Um, skin cancer, right, if the test was only run on light-skinned people, it's not going to actually detect the lesions on other people and one where there was a um, commercial algorithm to figure out who should be contacted for um, more particular care right to say remember to take your medicine remember to sign up for this program and th what they used the data from was uh, who's basically using most medical services now so it looped back into people who actually weren't as sick but were just had the money to mm -hmm. access resources so we want to make sure that we use AI systems, they don't go down those roads. You know, you brought up a really interesting point as you bring in the medical providers. I, I didn't have this on your questions, but I do want to ask it about encryption. I mean, health privacy is definitely its own um, set of, uh, a subcategory of the online privacy debate. You know, we have HIPAA and we have requirements. There have been a lot of uh, waivers provided to some of these restrictions to, you know, enforce, or, uh, put out things like telehealth, et cetera. So Michelle, I have a question for you in terms of encryption. And Alex, is this a good time for us to really see full encryption as we have more of this health data flow over our smartphones or over our tablets or over our computers? Uh, with our doctors, because I, you know, when I think of contact tracing in the context of what the media has talked about, this is, they're talking about as a one touch. But as I listen to both of you, this is a long term process, right, that we're going to go through. And contact tracing will probably involve some other factors to make sure that we get to healthier communities. So just a, just a comment, cr encryption, should we be looking at full encryption on these, tra on these interactions between people and their medical providers? You want to go first, Michelle? Yeah, I, I think um, that is definitely a best practice to make sure that these communications are protected from outsiders, right, and bad guys trying to get information and either exploit it or corrupt it. Um, so I think this is an example of where you have high stakes data use and sharing that needs to be protected. And this is a good example of where such a wraparound protection like encryption is going to benefit all of us. Mm -hmm. Alex? I think I have a different, I mean, I think encryption is important and valuable here. I think when I think about the privacy threat with contact tracing over the long term, I just have a, a slightly different concern, which is we have this promise from Google and Apple to remove this Bluetooth, you know, contact tracing data collection system after the pandemic is over. But you can imagine a circumstance where the pandemic really starts to drag on and we're a couple years in and there's a network of health applications that are using this data for COVID-19, but they've also mission creeped into various other things. And suddenly there is a financial market for the data or an incentive to use the data. Uh, and then, you know, you have this proliferation of apps, which of course the, the reason for the apps is to get people to collect and then share the data. And, you know, I, that's how I kind of think about this becoming a, a bigger problem where the data gets out, not necessarily a lack of the security, though I think that's worth being concerned about, but I worry more about the systemic leakage. This just becomes another market for data. And then three years, four years from now, Google and Apple shrug and say, hey, people are willing to give away their contact tracing data. Well, who are we to say that they can't? Right. And I think in that type of slow um, eroding of standards around data privacy and norms over time, that's that's what sort of makes me more concerned about this than, um, you know, than people literally stealing it. Yeah, no, I mean, that's been one of the concerns, right? The fact that um, you could see this ad market sort of, you know, using some of this data or what they extrapolate as the results of this contact tracing to create these other markets. And, you know, and the fact that, you know, you could also have false positives and false negatives. I mean, I think in, at the end, and again, for those of you that want to ask a question, please email them to events at brookings.edu or via Twitter at brookingsgov 
or hashtag AI bias so that we can uh, take your questions in the remaining 15 minutes that we'll have in a few moments. Um, you know, I do want to ask because I think, you know, we have a problem, both of my friends. And the problem is without contact tracing, and I do believe what Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks are saying when I listen to them in their daily briefings, that we have to have an intervention of physical contact tracers to help with this. We're not gonna figure this out by ourselves. It was successful during the HIV AIDS crisis where contact tracing was able to reduce the amount of infections simply because you could identify who that person was exposed to, but you also educated people along the way about good practices when it came to um, their relationships and their relations. Um, Ebola was the same thing. It did not hit America hard, but there was a lot of uh, contact tracing with mobile technologies that was sort of used. I looked at a study the other day in the Sudan where they said that essentially where there was mobile use, it helped. I guess the question I have for both of you before we run into questions and how do we make this all exist in a perfect world, right? How do we get the best of what technology has to offer today? Because we have tools, you know, and, and penetration of smartphones unlike we've ever had before, but we do have these privacy data concerns and potentially security concerns as well. So I'm just curious if you were given the golden wand and you were able to sort of extrapolate your opinion you know, what would, your be, what would be your thoughts on making this work in an equitable, uh, equally distributed manner, you know, and a private, ma a transparent and private, secure manner? You know, what would you say and what would be your advice to the people that are watching? Start with you, Alex. Uh, yeah, so if I really had to choose, and it's funny, I, I, I think this is a really tough question, but if I really, you know, w was uh, in charge, I think I would support um, a cohesive effort around digital contact tracing. Now we need the in-person contact tracing. I, I don't, don't even think I should weigh in. I feel like there's a billion epidemiologists who can weigh in that better than I can. Um, but on the digital side, the evidence suggests that it's a relatively low cost, right? You have to build the software and build an app. I think we should be engaging with the federal government's resources to do that, the US Digital Service perhaps ATF. You could also look at a volunteer organization that's formed in response to COVID-19 called the US Digital Response. Building a app that people can coalesce behind, um, proliferate broad, systemic, consistent guidance, right? Everyone needs to update their operating system, uh, download the app, report symptoms, get a test, report the test results, and I, again, I said everyone, but you know, encourage people. Now you keep saying that everyone. Oh my goodness! Crazy. Uh, I mean, it's unfortunate, right? Because it, it it works. <laughs> so people participate, but I've, we're not talking about requiring. We are talking about asking people who feel comfortable doing so to participate. Um, and in from a public health perspective, I do think that would be very valuable um, if if we could get people to do it. Uh, the alternative is just not very good. Contact tracing in person doesn't work at all if you don't know the person, right? If I walk by someone in a, a coffee shop and I can't identify them, a public health authority can't get in touch with that person, right? Mm. So, are, so they, they complement each other in meaningful ways. So if, if I absolutely, you know, if just choose right now, I would say we should do it. Now, the issue with that is can this federal government uh, execute in a responsible uh, and comprehensive way? Maybe, maybe not. And maybe we should be considering whether a a collaboration of state governments can do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm honestly uneasy, but I think that would be um, that would be my choice. Yep, Michelle, what about you? Um, can I actually go in a different direction and say um, we have so many people in on the contact tracing now that if you know the, the tech community is looking to get involved, they should start turning to what comes next of mm -hmm. how we make sure children are still educated, how people are able to get food, how small businesses are surviving. Mm -hmm. We have so many things that are going to be with us now for years after this, right? And if I, I think where we want all of that American innovation and that tech power, there are a lot of other problems too. Right. So don't say, man, I want to be like the guy who builds the, you know, 98th um, proximity tracker from Bluetooth. Um, be the guy who says, I I'm going to figure out a way to help get people back to work. Right. Or fill some of these jobs that are not working right now. There, there are so many problems right now that are stemming from the coronavirus that there's plenty of work to go around. Yeah, no, there's plenty of work for us too. Okay, I'm gonna give one more last shameless plug. I do have a book coming out on the digital divide because I think this is so interesting that uh, for 
all of us on this call and some of you who are listening, we've been talking about digital divide issues for a really long time. We've talked about digital access and we've seen just a growing marketplace for digital services. And we do have to start asking ourselves, these are uh, areas where we can contribute a little bit, but we really need to look at the lot. And the lot means that, you know, there will be people who will be left behind simply because the new normal is not going to look like it did before. I mean, look, look at what we're doing right now, right? I keep telling people, this is my boss is looking. These actually work <laughs> um, in terms of events. All right, I want to go to some questions because we've got a lot on this screen. Um, I'm going to try to answer as many questions as possible. If we don't get to all of your questions, I would ask that you tweet them to the hashtag of AI bias, or you send it to uh, uh, label at Brookings, Brookings Gov at the end of your questions on Twitter so we could try to answer them and keep the dialogue going. So this is from Deanna who asked, how effective do we really think Bluetooth systems might be for tracking when A, not everyone has a smartphone or device or there might be bias towards underserved populations? So how effective we think Bluetooth systems might be for tracking? Uh, I, can do, I can just do a little bit. We don't know the, you know, this is one of those complex systems problems. And so people have tried to model it. The models are deeply flawed, but okay. Um, and I think they suggest that it, you know, at, at well, I can, I can give you a few statistics about the US. So there was a survey about how many people would, um, be willing to sign up and about 75% of people polled in the US, maybe, maybe a little higher, like 80% said they would definitely or probably sign up for an app, um, you know, in the abstract, who knows what that looks like. Um, that's of smartphone users. If that number is true, that's enough for it to be a meaningful impact. It does not fix everything on its own, but it, it's enough that it systemically um, helps us ease restrictions faster, right? Ret a, a quicker return to normalcy. Um, how well does it really work for each, in, you know, the, the broad effect is easier than the individual effect. The individual effect might be that a lot of individual people get false positives and they end up staying home and, you know, when they're not actually, when they weren't actually sick or, so there, there are certainly harms as Michelle has mentioned. Um, so I, I think the big picture, probably encouraging, the, the small micro level may be less great. Okay. Uh, Michelle, I do have a question in regards, uh, I think you might be able to answer it if you don't feel comfortable not answering it, let me know. So somebody from Kentucky asked, do we really believe that Apple and Google will disable the contact tracing after the need? And how is this different from the Facebook trust us model of that data privacy? Yeah, so um, I, I think I, so there are certainly risks, but benefits to having these big choke points in the data system, right? And frankly, it will be easier to track with Google and Apple are doing than it will be to track maybe hundreds of different app developers and you don't know who the real people are behind them, right? And so we're actually gonna have to count on them in a lot of ways to make sure that um, the APIs are designed in ways to minimize access to information that's not necessary, that they're shut down at the appropriate time, right? And that these companies are gonna have affirmative obligations to make sure that the people who are building these apps are doing what they say they're doing. Um, this is a new expectation over the last few years and it's um, how you avoid, you know, sort of the Cambridge Analytica of the coronavirus era, right? Is that uh, we need to make sure people are actually following through and doing what they say they're doing with our data. Um, I say the one benefit of this happening after so much public attention on these really high profile events is I think you see big companies being more serious about it, right? They know they're under the microscope um, and they know that there are people now, whether it's the media or technologists, you know, um, reverse engineering everything they do. So I think they know they are under a lot of scrutiny and that will help keep them all in line. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, this comes from Lydia. Many disabled folks, especially disabled people of color, are terrified of increased surveillance because their communities are hyper surveilled or criminalized. We don't trust corporations or states. How can we assure that we aren't missing from public in public health? Which is interesting, right? Because in many respects, you have to voluntary opt in, but it also means you have to be visible, right? To the public health providers as well as the tech company. So just curious, and a couple of questions actually had this. What do we do with the people who aren't on any of this technology? Will they just uh, rely upon physical contract rates? Or what do you think? <sighs> yeah, um, I, I can say 
systemic, you know, historically the role of AI and technology around people with disabilities has not been good. Um, they are not frequently accounted for in the development of systems and that has led to them being disadvantaged by those systems. Um, we've certainly, that is, you know, what, so I've talked about uh, AI bias. In, in some ways you should assume by default that these biases exist unless they are very consciously uh, uh, approached and sort of, um, there's a big effort in, in mitigating those biases. People with disabilities are completely right to be concerned about that. Mm -hmm. um, now that's specific to AI. In this context, I'm, I maybe don't have a great answer on the surveillance side. Um, I don't know if Michelle has a, a, a better take than I do. Well, I think there, there's a couple of things here. One is that you want sort of these purpose limitations, which I feel like I've been talking about forever, but here's a perfect example where to the extent that people are collecting and using information, it always has to be to offer services, right? It cannot ever seep into law enforcement uses or immigration enforcement or determining benefits and all these things that um, the government could do with the data, right? Um, you really want to make sure it is um, served. But this is where I think the whole point of processing all this data is we're supposed to be able to make better um, insights without having to track individuals, mm -hmm. right? So if there is a community, we, we already know where they are, that they're gonna have special challenges because they're disabled or they have pre-existing health conditions, you send the resources there, right? We don't say we need every single one of you to download this app so we could track you constantly. We just use our common sense here of how we get services to the people that we know are already gonna have problems um, with it's, whether it's getting the actual healthcare they need, practicing social distancing, working from home, schooling. Um, this is all foreseeable. That's the th funny thing, right? Is a lot of the things that um, have come up in the last few weeks, they are long standing problems in our society. They've been documented a million different times, right? Um, so it's all foreseeable and it should be something that is addressable and we should get to work on now um, and doesn't require individual surveillance. Right. So, and I think it also brings up a point that um, I'd like to just throw in here, which is, you know, this whole idea of, you look at the disability community, I see a question came through about the immigrant community. In those communities that have ex been exposed to hyper surveillance, we also don't want them hyper tracked. Um, and so if you can think of ways to universally deploy the technology where you can actually pay attention to the infection rates, and I think what Alex said earlier, overlaying on a different side what the uh, trends are in terms of demographics. You sort of collect data from everybody, which I think we've heard from the medical experts is particularly pertinent to this because COVID has no color, right? It has no ability. It has no gender. It's affecting everybody there. Let me keep going because we keep talking about this. I want to go back to a question on Europe. Um, Emily asks, around the world, but especially in Europe, how legitimate are claims that large swaths of data are anonymized? So are we just hearing this, Alex or Michelle, or is it really being anonymized to the point of not being able to be de-identified? Oh, specifically with COVID-19, um, it's not, that's, you know, I honestly don't know the answer to that question is, is the short answer that um, it's, their data collection has not been so far dramatically different. I guess, you know, actually that's not totally true because in the UK they have a contact tracing mm -hmm. application and we've seen um, other places internationally uh, where contact tracing has had sort of, you know, adversarial attacks that have been successful. So I'll, I'll, I can talk about that a little bit, which is that if you create a system in which tons of people are using these uh, contact tracers, there are opportunities for people to um, find ways to uh, reveal private information from them, right? So you might think that a Bluetooth uh, system only works at five or 10 or 20 feet or so, um, while well, you can build an antenna that makes it work at a substantially larger distance. You can use several people's devices to uh, come in contact with one other person's device to target them to see if you hear uh, information and, and potentially learn something about them. So there are ways that these systems um, can be kind of hacked to reveal private information. And we have seen that in a few places internationally. I think some of the researchers in the United Kingdom have been pointing out those, um, those issues as they've developed their contact tracing. I think broadly European data, I don't know if I want to speak that uh, in such a wide swath about the state of their anonymization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, they are still in the process of um, finalizing their protocols, and I don't think it's done yet, but, you know, 
Um, sounds like they are talking about some recognized best practices in privacy engineering and risk assessment type work. But um, again, I think like Alex, I, I'm always afraid to declare something safe, right? Because there, it's always <laughs> shocking, right? That, that people take time and energy to do certain things um, that are not constructive and who knows. But um, it looks though that they are probably gonna get to it in Europe before they get to it here in the United right. States. So hopefully we'll be able to learn something from their experience. Well, this goes to a question I want to ask um, from Frederick. If a country such as the U.S. doesn't implement contact tracing, as in South Korea and Singapore, would that not discourage those other countries from coming to the U.S. and others, you know, that may be looking at us and say, hey, they don't do contact tracing, so I'm not really believing that they're trying to, um, I mean, you know, we did open the beaches and stuff, right? But I'm sorry, that was a sigh. But I'm just asking, like, will that be a discouragement globally if the United States doesn't look at contact tracing as a key priority? And will it be compared to what other countries are doing in terms of their contact tracing? I can, I mean, I think broadly the U.S. response has been bad enough and the extent of the pandemic here wide enough that we will get compared and are being compared disfavorably to many other countries. Uh, and that's gonna affect, yeah, I, I imagine that will affect tourism. Um, I think higher education institutions are in for a tough couple of years uh, as they're, uh, you know, a lot of income comes from foreign uh, students um, who, who may not be as compelled to come um, or if they're attending remotely, you know, attending remotely or on Zoom. Uh, so I don't know if it's specific to contact tracing, but certainly the the prevalence of COVID-19 and the lethargic um, response, both at the federal level and as we've seen recently in a couple of states, we're seeing re uh, uh, restrictions being eased. Uh, the Georgia, I think we just found out yesterday. Uh, and yeah, that would, that I imagine will have an effect on other people and, and uh, traveling to the U.S. for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think, um, you know, that ship has already sailed in a lot of ways, right? You know, I think there were countries who advised their folks to come home if they were in the United States because they could, could not expect to get modern health care if they stayed here and were to get sick, right? Um, and we're definitely on the world stage and they're following um, every tweet and every, you know, action our government takes. So I don't think anybody would say, wow, if they just had the contact tracing, I might, you know, vacation in the U.S. this year. Um, but, you know, this is um, probably going to happen in some form and, you know, keep going back to we are already doing contact tracing, right? Um, we will probably supplement it further with more technology, but it's already happening and it's part of a bigger systemic problem that we need to address. Yeah, I mean, we had, um, I, I did have one more question that I would like to ask you all because um, we've got to wrap up. Do you think this will affect um, people differently? Will we see a more, a, a more likelihood among students to actually download um, or utilize digital tools uh, as part of government surveillance of the uh, virus? Will we see older people you know, migrate towards this? Will this become something that they want to do? I'm just curious what you all think in terms of um, where people might fall in terms of the application of these tools. I can guess a little. I don't know, Michelle, do you have a good answer? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Um, we know that um, old uh, elderly people who are at the most risk also have the lowest smartphone ownership, uh, along with very, very young people, right? Like, so it's like over 70 and under 10 have the lowest smartphone ownership, um, which means that this doesn't help them very much at all. Um, and so you would be concerned about a solution driven at contact tracing and technology that then said, oh, well, everyone in nursing homes is gonna be fine. That would not be a good combination of policies. Um, so, you know, among people who do have smartphones, I haven't seen anything, so I'd just be totally guessing, right? I mean, I think we have seen people in uh, some younger people, yeah, anecdotally, we've seen stories of younger people continuing to drink and go out to bars later than everyone else, but then we've also had anecdotal evidence of older people continuing to go out as well. And so I, I don't know if we, we know that much. And Twitter and some of the internet has played a kind of blame game where it takes selective pictures of photos and say it's this generation's fault. And uh, I haven't found those arguments very compelling. Mm -hmm. Michelle? 
Uh, I think we need more information and it probably will depend on what the tools are and who operates them, right? We've already seen some backlash to government programs, but we've also seen backlash to corporate run tools. Um, some of it will be voluntary, some of it won't be. And um, I think it's hard to tell now, but it'll probably be very different depending on who's the target and uh, who the actor is. Yeah, I mean, you all sent so many wonderful questions. I wish I could actually get to them all because it seems like as we go deeper into this conversation, I think we generally agree that contact um, tracing is going to be something that's needed, whether it's in the physical form or supplemented by digital. I think the conversation also sort of suggested that we need to think about the privacy implications, the data security implications, and just the long-term maintenance of that information and how it gets used and applied to different populations. I mean, going forward, I think as a nation, we all show that this social distancing could be attempted. I keep going back to Alice's question about one day getting in my inbox that I have to download something or I have to make sure my location data is available. I think that's where we get into this fine line of going back to what Michelle said, where we're really bringing in surveillance that has never been seen before in this country in ways that have been positive. So with that, I want to thank you both for actually joining me for this webinar. This is a very interesting dialogue. For those of you that joined us via the web or your whatever way you came on, Thank you also for joining us. The video will be up shortly on the Brookings website. And we this uh, series and conversation is part of our AI uh, initiative here at Brookings, uh, particularly the one that I lead, which is around AI bias. So look for more events around this. And again, look to the papers that we referenced that will be available on the Brookings website. With that, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.